Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, I guess I'll start with this statement you heard many, many times. The definition of insanity is you do the same thing again and again and you hope for different results. Well, if this is true, weight loss programs and doing one after another, true definition of insanity. Um, a thorough analysis of weight loss programs was conducted by a research group in the UK. And I have to say, uh, well, first of all, it's, the UK is one of those places where it's a great opportunity to study because, because it's socialized or, or nationalized healthcare. They have huge databases of people to look at. And so that was part of the strength of this particular study. You're going to be shocked. I was shocked at how ineffective programs are. But anyway, the researchers looked at the medical records of over 76,000 obese men and almost 100,000 obese women. This is a really big group. They excluded anybody who had undergone bariatric surgery and instead looked at the people uh, during nine years of follow-up that lost weight without bariatric surgery, which is just in case you get the idea that that's effective, go look at my health Brace online library articles about that. Don't even consider that. But anyway, um, out of the group, remember we had over 76,000 obese men, 1,283 reached normal body weight. We had almost 100,000 women, 2,245 reached normal body weight. Now they had them divided into different categories of obesity. So for those with simple obesity, and that was a BMI of between 30.0 and 34.9, the probability that an obese man would obtain normal weight was 1 in 210 for women, 1 in 124. I guess we're a little more successful at it than the men are. The statistics were even worse for morbidly obese people defined as a BMI between 40 and 44.9. Probability for attaining normal weight for morbidly obese men was 1 in 1290, 1 in 677 for morbidly obese women. The annual probability that a morbidly obese person would lose just 5% of body weight was 1 in 8 for men and 1 in 7 for women. Now, I'm going to put it in another way because I know I ran all those numbers by you. So what does this really mean? The failure rate, let's look at it that way, for reaching normal weight for morbidly obese people is 99.92% for men and 99.85% for women. The failure rate for losing 5% of body weight for morbidly obese people, 87.5% for men, 85.7% for women. I think we can say that all of this is a resounding failure. I mean, that's a ridiculously high failure rate. But the bad news doesn't stop there. While weight loss was noted more in people who started at a higher BMI, this weight loss was often followed by weight gain rather than sustained weight loss or, um, or further weight loss. The cycling of weight loss and weight gain was most common in morbid, morbidly obese patients and is particularly concerning because as bad as it is for health to maintain morbid obesity, it is worth to, worse to cycle up and down. And so I, I don't like for people to think the sucker's choice is too bad choices. I either cycle up and down or I stay morbidly obese. How about none of that and we try to find something effective that could get you to normal body weight but obviously all this stuff not working the researchers concluded that healthcare should focus more on preventing weight gain and on maintaining weight loss if achieved the researchers also concluded that quote the greatest opportunity for tackling the current obesity epidemic may be found outside primary care the data are alarming but not surprising Gaining weight seems to be very easy for some people. I know it's harder for me to lose it than gain it. I think I'm pretty normal that way. The simplistic advice to just eat less and control portions and count calories, it, it ignores the fact that people eat for a whole lot of reasons that don't have anything to do with hunger. Food has essentially become a legal drug for many people. And you know our own Del Shroff has talked about that numerous times on videos about how his eating situation, which he still struggles with, and then he's been very generous about sharing with himself um, and his experience with other people, but um, it doesn't have anything to do with being hungry and portion control. It has to do with, I think, just escaping excruciating pain, and sometimes life can be really painful. Well, when you look at other drugs that people use, like alcohol and, and street drugs, we don't tell people drink less or try to control your heroin usage. I mean. It's ridiculous advice. And, and so I think that um, we do need to work on prevention. We can keep this from getting worse by focusing on how to not keeping, how to, how to keep people from gaining weight. But 
we really have got to spend some time and effort developing a comprehensive approach to weight loss until we find some things that work. And I think there are some things that work out there. We have had some success with, with our program, uh, but this has motivated me to spend more time and attention on it. And in addition to that, I just read a book um, which I am doing my advanced study course on this month called The Sober Truth. And it's about the failure of 12-step programs. They work for some people, by the way. Authors acknowledge that, I acknowledge that, but the failure of 12-step programs to address the vast majority of people who are addicted to anything, uh, whether it's alcohol, drugs, food, you name it, uh, or compulsive shopping or anything. So um, this, is a, this is a major issue in society. And, and actually, the authors of this book put forth some things that I think are pretty interesting in terms of opportunities to look at uh, solving the weight loss problem a little differently and, um, and focusing more on the psychology of compulsive behavior. Anyway, so now that's a perfect lead-in for what I want to talk about next, which is a health education, for pro uh, a health education program for preschoolers that actually was proven to work. Okay, so um, this, uh, this was in Madrid, Spain. And researchers can, did a controlled intervention trial that involved 24 public schools. And so half of the schools were assigned to the C, SI exclamation program, Spanish, you know, which included health-oriented education, and the other ser half served as controls. They just got the usual curriculum in school. Uh, the goal of the program was to use health education to change the knowledge, attitudes, and habits of preschool children and to help the kids develop healthy diet and exercise habits. The primary outcomes to be measured were changes in their knowledge, their attitudes, and their habits, or KAH score. So there were a little over 2,000 kids. They were between the ages of three and five, and the children, teachers, and families were involved in the intervention. I think this is one of the reasons why it worked, as it was a very comprehensive approach. During the school year, trained teachers conducted 20 hours of classroom sessions on diet exercise and then general information about the human body and health, and they did another 10 hours on emotional health, and then classroom materials and activities for the families were provided on the weekend. After three years of follow-up, children involved in the program showed significant improvement in their KAH scores as compared with the control group, and the kids in the intervention also showed improvements in their diets and physical activity. The effect was noticeable after the first year of the program, but it got better in the second year and better in the third year. Um, children who participated the entire three years did the best, and they also had a small reduction in skinfold measurement. There we go to the prevention aspect of this. If we can get these kids early enough, we can do something before they grow up to have all kinds of health issues, including weight. Uh, parental education and income uh, um, levels did have a little bit of an effect. The most significant changes took place in families where the parents had a high school education. The researchers concluded that educational programs like this are effective for helping preschoolers develop healthy habits and that better outcomes are achieved when the kids start early and they do it for the whole three years. I have a better idea. What if good health education were provided all through school? What a concept, right? Well, I don't think the results are surprising of this. I mean, if we want kids to know about how to take care of themselves and healthy eating and having a health value system, we have to teach it to them. I mean, they're not going to learn it because it's going to fall out of the sky and into their head. Um, parents, school personnel, teachers, food service people, everybody should be made aware of this. And I'll tell you why this is important right now. There has been an attempt recently, I'm sure you've read about it, the newspapers and media have covered it a lot, and the coverage has made me nauseous, to tell you the truth. What's happened is that the food service operations have replaced some unhealthy kids' favorites, like fried chicken and that sort of thing, with more fruit and vegetables, and of course the kids don't like it. Um, and the reason is that nothing happened except the change. I mean, they just swapped it out, and then the kids started complaining, and then the parents and the media and the teachers, everybody sympathizes with them, those poor children eating fruits and vegetables, when actually the whole thing could have been averted with an education program. And if you want to see some of this and how it can work, because my fear is that this will just get written off as, uh, see, it doesn't work to change the food, the kids won't eat healthy foods, and that is not true. So if you want to see how this can work, a colleague of mine, her name is Dr. Antonia Dimas. She's spoken at our conferences before. Uh, she started something called the Food Studies Institute, and she's installed healthy eating programs in schools all over the country and done workshops to show people how to do it. And if you go to her website, you'll see these videos, and they just warm your heart. These kids loving Brussels sprouts, loving cherry tomatoes and black beans and the whole thing. 
And what she does is she teaches them to love these foods. They've never tried them, but you know, kids, first of all, they love food that they grow. So school gardens and home gardens and community gardens can be a great way to teach kids, and she's all over that. Educational programs that combine healthy eating with learning about where the food comes from and cultures and all that sort of thing. It's amazing how open kids will be to learning about good foods, but you can't just swap out chicken nuggets for you know corn and peas and expect that the kids are going to be all jacked up about that on their own. You, we have to do something about it. So anyway, I'm hoping some people pay attention to this and before we just abandoned all, all thoughts of helping kids improve their their lunch uh, eating, maybe we could um, we could back up and do some education. And one other thing I'll mention to you, um, one year we did a conference on just kids nutrition in the summer. And I'll never forget this woman, her name escapes me right now, but she came from a school in Long Island. And um, the school was, uh, it was a private school, but the parents had, um, and the founder of the school had been um, adamant that part of the culture of the school would be healthy eating. And so she was talking about uh, the day, and, and so they had health, health education programs to teach the kids to want healthy food, and then the, the school cafeteria served healthy food. So um, the, the woman who was head of the food service was our guest speaker, one of our guest speakers. She was talking about the first time that she served rutabaga to the kids. Now you ask the average kid, half of them don't know what a rutabaga is, and if they've ever seen one, they're probably pretty sure they don't want to eat it, right? Well, the kids learned about rutabaga and why it's good food, and then they made um, uh, rutabaga oven fries. They were no fat and seasoned and the whole nine yards, and, and she said the kids scarfed them down. There were no rutabaga fries left, and then they started asking, when do we get some more rutabaga? Are we having rutabaga today? Are we gonna have rutabaga next week? And so that's, these are just examples that the problem isn't the kids, the problem is the approach. So let's get around doing something constructive about this. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think will enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.